So now, five minutes later, forget about everything until now. So container solutions, next, next. Uh, right, so two stories. The first one is, uh, is a man goes on a journey and second one is uh, somebody comes to a town, a stranger comes to a town. Next, so this, the, um, in our story, there is a stranger and the stranger is, uh, uh, before I talk about that, let's first talk about the protagonist, the main character of the story. And that's the company called Wellsgrid. It's essentially mid-size uh, financial company, successful, maybe two, 300 people with good technology. Everything is sort of okay with it and it's a nice place to work in. Next. And uh, in that company, um, the main character is Jenny. She's a technical manager. She's probably a former tech engineer, but uh, currently she, she's in charge of sort of connecting the business strategy coming from the executives to the technology uh, that engineers are implementing. Next. So who are the strangers in our story? Um, until last few weeks, next, yeah, I was talking about uh, three types of strangers. The first one is uh, a challenger bank, somebody like uh, like Starling Bank. It's a startup. It was created in 2013, but essentially the most important part is that they they could build an entire bank in less than a year with less than 20 people. So uh, the second one is uh, next. The second one is uh, uh, somebody like Amazon, a large technology giant that um, basically can do whatever they, they, they can use their technological capabilities to essentially ex enter any market. Now they are not financial company, but apparently they hold a banking license. And uh, some people say that they could become the biggest bank in US in just a matter of a couple of years, if they would like that. And it's not that they never entered random markets, they just recently in the last couple of years, they entered the market of a uh, retailer supermarket basically next and the third one is uh, uh, a, a traditional bank somebody like ing netherlands that they essentially say we're a tech company with banking license and they spend the last seven to ten years essentially becoming a technology company and investing massive amount of effort and money into uh, technology infrastructure next and here's the new one, right? That, that's a totally unexpected one. Three, three or four weeks ago, no one would imagine the impact of this thing would have on our, on our uh, way of uh, life. And, uh, and today, everyone has to respond to it. Next. So the thing with, with this crisis is, is that, uh, so if you look on the, uh, on the straight line, that's what Wells Grid is doing. Basically, they're delivering consistent value quickly and consistently to uh, their customers, but it's linear. Those newcomers, like, uh, uh, like those strangers, when they come to the market, then uh, their effect on the market is dramatic. And imagine Uber or Airbnb. And also, some people say, my market is protected from those kind of companies. They will never enter that. But in reality, if Uber and Airbnb could disrupt hotels and, and taxi businesses, uh, of course, it can happen in any, in any area. Next. Um, and the reason uh, for, uh, for this change is basically, is, uh, actually, go back. Um, no, can you further back? Can you refresh? How far back? Station? One sec. Which one do you want? Just refresh it. Yes. Yeah, now it's good. Okay. Next. Next. Okay. 
So the reason for this is that uh, basically those uh, uh, those newcomers, what they can do is to um, to um, innovate faster. So the reason they can do it is because they are using new technologies. They can quickly build variety of different experiments, experiment with different things, show it quickly to the customer, and then move on and uh, um, and build something new based on the feedback from the customer. Next. <clears throat> so the other thing is that in the beginning, Wells Grid is just uh, uh, it's just not this, this changes in the market are just not registering on the on their radar and the reason is because uh, uh, because in the beginning the impact of companies like uh, like Starling is are minor there may be thousand customers maybe two thousand customers it really is nothing it's not even uh, a single percent of market share therefore they just uh, they they maybe don't even know that those startups exist and they continue behaving like nothing happens. The problem is that once those startups show any sort of progress, any sort of traction, then immediately they can access to unlimited funding and uh, effectively unlimited funding. And then they spend all this funding on innovation and research. On the other hand, the moment that a company like Wellsgate feels pressure, financial pressure and reduced revenue, the first thing to do would be to cut on innovation and use investment in new technologies. Next. And then, then what happens is that this unexpected crisis, like the one we're experiencing now with, with the uh, coronavirus, totally shuffles all the cards and then everyone has to respond uh, quickly. And the question, can even uh, Wells Grid respond that quickly? So now we're talking about two types of, uh, of uh, crises. Both are existential crises. One is something like cloud native change. The entire world is moving to new technologies, and this is happening slow over, over course of multiple years. And the main challenge in this field, in this area is basically deal with resistance. So uh, take active actions to actually start the change. On the other hand, in the fast crisis, like in Corona case, uh, the change happening overnight, almost overnight, in a matter of weeks, and the response needs, needs to be immediate. Next. So first, uh, I'll talk about the slow market change, which is uh, which is basically the story I was take, talk, uh, talking about uh, until last few weeks. Next, and uh, in this situation, uh, the market is changing. Everyone is doing cloud native, uh, and at that point, Jenny, as our main character, middle manager, she understands that something has to be done, and. Otherwise, the company will consistently fall behind and then will basically slowly lose its business value. Next. Um, the first thing they do, they basically try to, to, do, to go cloud native like nothing happened, basically as a technical change. I mean, Kubernetes, we've all been in conferences like we are now in the rejects. I mean, this, this is a conference that's supposed to be a follow-up conference to KubeCon. So you go to KubeCon, you meet somebody like, or you, you listen to somebody like Kelsey Hightower and you say, I mean, Kubernetes, how hard can it be? You can play Tetris, Tetris Live in Kubernetes, multiple clusters and do magic on stage. So how, how hard can it be? Next. So apparently it can be pretty hard. Uh, so in most cases, what happens next is about six to 12 months later, you realize that actually, not much happened. There are some tiny elements of progress, but really there is no pre anything. There is no cluster, there is nothing moved uh, because everyone is busy to actually build the, the current products. Next. Uh, so at that point, Jenny thinks we, we need to do something else. Next. And uh, the next is to basically do it properly. Invest proper resources, set up a team, uh, divide the current engineering team into uh, more legacy oriented and, and then more uh, cloud native oriented teams. So let's say split it in half and then uh, uh, get approval from the executives. It takes a while. It's pretty complex uh, project. So there's two months of uh, documenting it, planning it, creating architecture, but eventually they get the, pro uh, the approval. 
And the idea is that within six months, they can be fully cloud native and then repay the investment by faster delivery. Next. And six to 12 months later, of course, it's still nowhere. And, and uh, when the executives start, uh, when, when Janie asks the, the engineers, what's the progress, they say it's like 70% done. And uh, we all know what 70% by engineers means. Uh, so at that point, there is quite a significant problem. And we are already uh, one to two years into the transformation. Next. So why it's so difficult? Next. Because uh, first it's uh, generally CNCF is talking about uh, cloud native as technological change. Tech, it's mostly about technology, microservices, containers, and Kubernetes. Uh, they do say that it is about building great products faster, essentially faster delivery to the customers for experimentation rather than larger scale. Although those technologies came from larger scale companies like Netflix and Google and uh, whoever else. But really mostly they are used for uh, uh, agile development for uh, faster innovation. Next. So if according to uh, CNCF, we're talking about infrastructure and provisioning and architecture, next, what we think the full transformation scope is, is actually much, much wider. It's also about uh, development processes, about team structure, about uh, the product design, and eventually up to the culture. So essentially, if you want to be cloud native, we believe that you need to change the entire company and the way you work. Otherwise, just technological change will not be sufficient to, uh, to help you to get the maximum value from, from this transformation. Next. <clears throat> and of course, it's a new ecosystem. And this is again, this is the landscape by CNCF. And uh, currently, there's over, over 1,200 pieces in it. It's just complex, a new ecosystem that is going through explosion of new tools and also consolidation of old tools. And it's very, com very difficult to figure out uh, what actually is needed for, for a successful and stable cloud native platform. Next. So at that point, the executives start to start losing the, uh, uh, the patience with the engineering team. So the question is, I mean, you have to deliver this stuff. It's, it's, the, the legacy is not going anywhere. We, we cut the engineering team by half, the team that was delivering the old product, and the new one delivers nothing. So at this point, either you start delivering the features I need to deliver to my customers, or we will just, I don't know, cancel the, the entire transformation or maybe hire external, external or outsource it somewhere. So that is a very significant challenge. And, and at this point, Jenny and the engineering team, they have to respond very, very quickly and, uh, uh, and go very quickly to production. Otherwise, uh, they, they just potentially lose the entire project. Next. So we need to do something else. Next. So a quick overview of a couple of tools I'm going to use to actually help us to understand the successful uh, transformation. So the first one is the difference between creativity and proficiency. Next. So uh, essentially in the beginning, in the startup stage, uh, the uh, the idea is in, in a sort of mystery. It's, it's, uh, it's like when you open uh, a new startup, you have a new idea for a new product, you, you really don't know what, what you're doing. You don't know if people want it, you don't know if people need it, you don't know how to build it, what to do. But then slowly you start to figure out, you build the first version, then the second version, you start to figure out what customers need, then it becomes a heuristic. And uh, uh, next, and uh, if, and uh, eventually it becomes pretty much algorithmic when, uh, when you know exactly what's going to happen. So imagine McDonald's when the first restaurant is a mess, mystery, then, then uh, you got, get up to four or five uh, successful restaurants and it's sort of heuristic, you get the point, but then you fail with the sixth one or fifth one. And then somebody comes and, uh, and creates very consistent process and scales it up to tens of thousands of restaurants 
then it becomes pretty, pretty much algorithmic. Next. Um, also, the, the uh, organizational structure changes over time towards more, more bureaucracy. Next. And uh, on the other hand, the most of the revenue, most of the money comes when you actually can scale up and consistently deliver on large scale. Next. What is important to understand is that those four stages are different to the later stages. So in creative stage, the most important uh, things are creating purpose and safety and support the team to innovate and give them the autonomy to do whatever they like. You cannot force people to innovate faster. On the other side, in the proficient, once you get so closer to proficient and, uh, uh, and uh, consistent delivery, what you really need is more repetition, feedback, and small set of rules. So actually those teams, they are not better or worse than each other. They are very important, both of them, but um, they have to be managed in different ways. Next. And then uh, to add to it is this McKinsey, old McKinsey model about three horizons. So essentially the first horizon, this is the proficient horizon when you do mostly deliver the current products where most of the revenue comes from. That innovation is, uh, is basically creating the next set of products. And then research, that's where you look in a remote future and, uh, and just explore with uh, um, maybe one day it may become something important. Next. The biggest problem in enterprises is they are over invest into delivery. They, they don't deliver, they don't invest in balanced way into innovation and research, but the majority of enterprises that we made, they are too, too focused on delivery of what's going to happen now. So they forget essentially how to innovate and how research for the future. Next. And next. Uh, so basically startups and universities, of course, they're different startups. It's their business to innovate and universities, their business to research. Next. So the second tool is the patterns. Next, patterns come from this series of books from Christopher Alexander. They are about uh, actual architecture and, and city planning and, uh, and uh, uh, next. And uh, in those books, uh, he's talking about patterns. The first concept is patterns, which is essentially a word. Pattern is like a word, next. Um, so table, is a word that we sort of agree what it represents. But on the other hand, there are many, many ways to create a table. And, and there is no practical way to define table in a very good, consistent way. So it's just, it's something that allows us to have a conversation while still gives us the opportunity to, to be open and creative in, in how we build those tables. Same with chair and so forth. Next. Then there is a, a language. A language is, is basically all the world, words on some subject, like furniture language. And the next one is, uh, uh, next, is uh, designs. Those are stories you can build using those uh, words, like there's square table with four chairs and so forth. And, and uh, imagine you need to tell the same story without have the, having the common language or even having language at all, or having common language and uh, just, um, you, know, you talk to somebody who doesn't know what table is, then it makes the conversation very difficult. Next. And that basically means that, that a very good quote from Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein, it's, uh, he said, the limits of my language are limits of my world, world. Essentially, if I don't have a language to talk about certain subject, there is no way I can talk about that subject because I don't even know that the, what exists. Next. An example of that could be the car, right? We all know what car is and we agree and also in general uh, uh, components of the car, next. But when we go deeper and we decompose the car, right? Only people with the knowledge of those components with, with uh, all the mechanics of people who build or maintain cars, they can talk about much deeper level of, uh, of the car construction. So, uh, yes, and uh, so now back to the design of the transformation, back to Jenny. Next. So essentially, uh, 
that's how that's just one example of how we would uh, we would typically help Jenny or how Jenny would eventually figure out uh, to go through those challenges that I was talking about earlier. So those are the patterns essentially, like a table, a chair. So each one of those cards is a pattern. And what we would typically do uh, in this kind of Will's Great Story is to start with Transformation Champion, that's a person who would typically drive the transformation, then uh, create a business case to make sure that we know what we're doing and there's commitment from the executive, then get the executive commitment, next. Then create a small core team, um, typically, a uh, small team is more effective in, in new innovative projects rather than a large team. Create a vision, uh, then specific strategy and architecture, next. And then divide the team into essentially two parts. The majority of the, of the development team or engineering team should stay and continue building on pro all products. And this is only for, for a while, right? But it's very important to continue building the value uh, for the customers, so, so there will be less pressure from the management to, on, on this program. While uh, managing the other team, the core team that is building the, the new product, the new cloud native platform, manage it in more creative way and give them the opportunity to experiment, learn, try things, and, uh, and also fail on the way. Next. And eventually what they're going to do is to build distributed systems, through exploratory experiments, through building POCs, uh, then eventually building an MVP and prepare it for production next. And in the meanwhile, the rest of the organization will prepare for onboarding and next, and then the onboarding will happen gradually, step by step, team by team, pro product by product, next. And at the end, the uh, proficient teams on the top, they, continue, they can continue strangling the monolith, and then eventually potentially lift and shift remaining pieces to the cloud, while the creative team continues investing in those second and third horizons into innovation and, uh, and research. Next. And each one of those patterns can be expanded into more details. Next, and next, and next. And it's important to remember that, that there is also uh, cultural patterns. Uh, and this is a very good quote from Daniel Coyle. He said that culture is a set of uh, basically living relationships. What's important is that it's not something you are, it's something you do. Basically, if whatever you do every day, day by day, all the routine, all the uh, relationships and small things you are doing every day in your company, those are the things that define your culture. And if you can change them they, uh, step by step and introduce new things like a uh, uh, learning loop, like uh, psychological safety, like blameless inquiry or honest feedback, if you can step by step introduce those things, then over a longer period of time, also the culture will change. Next. And eventually what you want is a consistent three horizons uh, uh, backlog where Majority of the time going into delivery of current stuff, then uh, some time going into innovation and some into research. And uh, for example, in, uh, in both grid, Istio would, would be something like a research long term, not really needed now. In many companies, Istio would be actually in the current delivery pro, uh, backlog. Next. Okay, so that was a story of a long running crisis that takes years. It is still existential. If Bosgrid doesn't respond, it will disappear. But now there is a new one. That's what happens. Essentially, it's just for no warning, absolutely unexpected, the entire market collapses. Uh, the revenue goes into nowhere and essentially everyone the, the newcomers and the, and the old companies all in the same position in trouble. So the question, what can be done in this situation? Next. Right, so, and, and the result is basically pretty simple. We are remote, the revenue going down dramatically, everyone is worried and, you know, and um, apparently there is no toilet paper in stores for whatever reason. Next. 
So what we actually realized in the last few weeks by dealing with this crisis in our own company is that many of those patterns that we were using for long, uh, uh, for long crisis, long running crisis, they actually apply also for a quick crisis. For example, dynamic strategy. So the principle of dynamic strategy is that's where you create a strategy where with, uh, when you aim somewhere, but you continuously evaluate the situation and adjust to current conditions. And that is very relevant for transition to cloud native, but it even more relevant and even more extreme in, in uh, response to, uh, to the corona crisis. Under such heavy pressure, the values of the company becomes much clearer. Are you going to lay off your people? Are you going to uh, absorb the cost? To, are you ready uh, to survive, to, to sort of get into hibernate state and survive for, for many months? How you are going to treat your people? We see many companies laying off people without thinking much. Those are the values. Those values were there all the time, but now they are, they are coming out. And at the end, if your organization cannot learn and cannot adjust to the new environment, then uh, this crisis will almost certainly will be very dramatic and, uh, and very negative. Next. Uh, on the other hand, if you were already ready for remote teams and you already know how to manage for creativity and let people invent solutions and involve them, and you're already on the public cloud where you don't really need to, to approach your service and click on them, then you know, maybe you are so much more ready for, for this crisis than anyone else. Next. And in the last week, I started working on a new pattern language, which is for now called crisis management pattern language. And, and really there is, what we see, see there are three main uh, uh, elements to it. One is defensive response to a crisis, cutting costs uh, or uh, trying to find new cash or, or basically uh, keeping, keep surviving for longer. So essentially defensive action. The second and uh, cost reduction is an example of that. Uh, the second one is leadership, strong leadership, especially important in such fast crisis, immediate action, immediate and decisive action. Um, for example, full transparency is very important in that event. If you don't tell people what's going to happen and why you're taking uh, the story, um, why, why are they taking certain steps, then uh, um, there will be no motivation to support you. And the last one is continue innovating. Otherwise, you will find it very difficult to, to get out of the crisis. Uh, next. Those are the patterns, not going to get into that. This is just the beginning of the story. Next. Um, and the last point to finish is uh, cognitive biases. So if you didn't read this book, I strongly recommend to do it. And there are a variety of other books about behavioral economics. Next. But basically there is one specific cognitive bias that I have chosen for this is illusion of control. I think, uh, it, it basically says tendency, tendency, our tendency to overestimate uh, our degree of influence over the uh, uh, external events. Uh, in slow running crisis, it's, um, there is much stronger illusion that we control things, but now it's pretty obvious that our control over the world is very, very limited. And every day we can, the world can change and we should always be prepared for that. Next. So essentially, the strangers are coming slowly or quickly, but they are coming if you want it or not, and you have very little control over that. The only question is, are you ready or not? Next. And if you want to uh, get updates on these new patterns, you're welcome to leave your email there and, uh, and we will send some updates once they are ready. And that's it. Thank you.